All right, I want you to turn in the Yom Kippur book, please, to page 18, to Kol Nidre, which uh, is appropriate since we're going to be learning a little bit <coughs> about Kol Nidre, and I really was excited by this because I got to learn a lot about Kol Nidre that I had heard but did not actually know, including a couple really cool things that I didn't know at all, and that is the beautiful thing of Jewish learning. There's always something new to learn. So everyone turn to page 18. It's good practice for me for uh, Wednesday night. Please turn to page 18. All right, let's just read Kol Nidre first. I think it's good since we're going to be speaking about Kol Nidre, although we're not going to be parsing the verbs or uh, breaking it down too specifically. We're going to be talking about it in general. Everybody knows Kol Nidre. It's as famous as the Shema. And uh, it was, of course, made famous in the jazz singer by our good friend Neil Diamond, who prayed with us about eight years ago when we used to offer a free High Holy Day community service at Chaparral Christian Church. Neil Diamond showed up one night. He had a concert the next night and apparently called his agent for uh, High Holiday tickets and showed up, but did not sing Kol Nidre. And Candace Ball at the time was really sad that she wasn't in the community service. Kol Nidre is, you may notice, uh, mostly in Aramaic. And we're going to get to that in a second, why it's in Aramaic as opposed to Hebrew. The rest of the Sidur Mahzer is in Hebrew. And it says the following, Kol Nidre, it starts out. All Nedarim, all vows resolves and commitments vows of abstinence in terms of obligation sworn promises oaths of dedication that we promise and swear to god and take upon ourselves from this day of atonement until the next day of atonement may it find us well we regret them and for all of them we repent let all of them be discarded and forgiven abolished and undone they are not valid and they are not binding. Our vows shall not be vows. Our resolves shall not be resolves. And our oaths, they shall not be oaths. And I just want to draw your attention on page 19 that the automatic reply, if you will, once we uh, recite Kol Nidre, is V'nislach l'chol edat b'nei Yisrael v'lager hagar betochem, betocham. Ki am bishgaga. Remember that word bishgaga. All shall be forgiven the entire community of Israel, the stranger who lives in their midst, for all have gone astray in error. So we have here words annulling vows. Okay? Nidarim, oaths or vows, are very, very important in Judaism. In fact, there is a tractate of Talmud called Nidarim. All right, I want to read to you something before uh, I begin my uh, notes. And we're each going to talk for about, I don't know, probably 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and then we'll answer some questions, and then the next speaker will come up. So I have some material to get through, but I will leave at least 10 minutes, if not a little bit more, for questions. All right, so I wanted to draw your attention. Keep your uh, page open to Cole Andrew. We'll go back there in a minute. And uh, keep in mind that word, Bishgaga. In the book of Exodus, there is a story, as you all recall, about a golden calf being built, a big idol being built by the Israelites under the direction of Aaron. And this is all as a result of what do we do? Moses is up on the mountain with God, printing up the tablets, printing up, he didn't have a printer, writing up the tablets, he didn't come back on time, everyone freaked out, and they said, let's worship um, a god, they collected all their gold jewelry and they melted it down into the golden calf. God was not happy. If you remember, in fact, after this happens, um, God basically, well, doesn't basically, in the Torah, in Exodus uh, chapter 32, uh, God tells Moses, hurry down, your people are a mess, and um, they have quickly turned aside from me. And God then says to Moses as follows, I see that this is a stiff-necked people, <laughs> right? Now, let me be that my anger may blaze forth against them and that I may destroy them. 
and make of you, Moses, a great nation. God wants to kill all of them. He wants to wipe them out for this sin. Okay, God gets very, very angry. And in God's rage, God basically vows to kill the people, to destroy all of them. Moses then implores God and says a bunch of things. Um, don't be so angry at them. You know, what will the Egyptians say? It's bad PR. The Egyptians will go around telling all the other nations, this is real God. Israeli God is, is really crazy. He, he, he redeemed all of these people from Egypt only to take them out to the desert to kill them. And God says, um, um, after Moses says, uh, oh, and by the way, you promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob um, that their offspring would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. You can't fulfill that promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob if you're going to off all of these people. There won't be any stars in the sky represented by this Israelite uh, nation. And it says in the Hebrew, in the, in the Tanakh, Vayinachom, Vayinacham Adonai El Hara'ah Asher Diber Asot Amo. And God said, um, I'm not going to do it. He renounces God's punishment that he had planned to bring upon the people. And so the rabbis in the commentaries suggest that the first ever Yom Kippur was that day. That was the first time that God ever accepted an apology. And in this case, it was from Moses. And so the rabbis teach us that on the first day of Elul was the day that Moses went up to the mountain. And on the 10th day of Tishrei, what we call Yom Kippur, was the day, the first time in the history of the history of the Jews, that God accepted the apology of someone, that God um, accepted Teshuvah, in this case, from Moses. And he says, Vayinachem Adonai, that God changed his mind, or basically decided uh, to accept Moses' plea, which we translate as forgiveness. He forgave Moses. So when you're at Shul on, on Yom Kippur and we begin with Kol Nidre, um, don't forget that the first one happened about 3,250 years ago at Mount Sinai on this day, on the day when God became so enraged because God could have just wiped him out easily and accepted Moses' apology. And we should be like Moses. We should apologize. We're going to come back to that in a second if we have time. I know all three of us have more material than we can possibly uh, cover, but that's what rabbis do when they get excited about teaching new stuff. Okay, so Kol Nidre. What are the problems with Kol Nidre? Does anyone want to, wanna, this will be the group participation part. Does anyone want to tell me a problem Whoa. with Kol Nidre? A problem with this thing that is on page 18. Yes. So that's great, Alex. It, 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 oh God, I have to stay here because of the video, I'm sorry. It plays on anti-Semitic, possible anti-Semitic, um, this construct that the Jews don't keep their vows, you know, and so why would you ever take the word of a Jew seriously? And that is, in fact, one of the great problems the rabbis have with Kol Nidre. Going back, dating back to its beginning of when it was written, um, most scholars believe that it was written in the 8th century at the latest. So about 1,200 year, 1200 years ago at the latest. Probably before then, but that was one of the main critiques and why the rabbis did not want Kol Nidre to be in the service. So, yeah, it led to anti-Semitism. What are the other problems with Kol Nidre? It's talking about the future, which means... Right, it says it right there, Sam, you're right. It says, from this day of atonement until the next day of atonement, may it find us well. And then it says, we regret all of these vows, oaths, dedications, sworn promises, let all of them be discarded and forgiven. So, not even retroactively, I always thought that Yom Kippur was a retroactive exercise, the year that passed, but as it turns out, according to Kol Nidre, it isn't. It's not about changing the past in its context, it's about changing the future. That's problematic. What else is problematic? And when I say problematic, what else do you think if you were, if you were looking at this prayer and you weren't Jewish and you didn't know anything about Yom Kippur, 
It leads to anti-Semitism. It's future. It's about changing the future or disavowing things that we're going to do. Yes. No, I think it actually more than softly excuses everything between this day and next Yom Kippur. It kind of wipes it out. And I don't think it's inadvertent. Gail initially said this is inadvertently wipes out all the days between now and next Yom Kippur. It actually wipes them out to a large extent when it comes to our vows and oaths and promises. Every single one of them, it seems to be saying, is inadvertent. Well, right? Like we didn't mean to do these things that we're going to do. No? Thank you. It doesn't hold us accountable to the sins that we're going to commit, or the vows that we're not going to keep, or the promises that we're going to break. It doesn't keep us accountable to any of those between now and next Yom Kippur, right? Great. Uh, yes? Ah, we're going to get to that later. Thank you. It, it, it gives us absolution regardless of intention. And intention is such an important concept. Because in Judaism, there are basically two types of sins, or numerous sins, obviously, numerous things that we can do wrong, and we'll read in the Ashamnu, when we get to the, uh, the Alchets and the Ashamnu, the specific sins that we commit. But there are inadvertent sins, things that we really did not mean to do, but we did. A lot of those having to do with like the dietary laws, and we didn't know that that meat wasn't kosher, like that kind of stuff. But then there are sins that are not inadvertent, and those are the sins where we uh, have this sort of mental element, they're premeditated sins, and um, that's a problem because, um, uh, guess what? Sins that we commit deliberately are not open to teshuva. You cannot repent to deliberate sins. Now we're going to create a legal mechanism in Kol Nidre to address that. So you, you read ahead, but I am so glad that you said that because intentionality is everything. Huge difference between an inadvertent sin and an intentional one. Mike. So I wanted to ask a more basic question. Yeah. Because Kol Nidre, the prayer... I'm is, glad that you brought that up because you're saying, is that God granting the prayer? Does the prayer ask for forgiveness? Or is it is it like, it's almost like, is it a, a um, rhetorical statement of some sort? And I just wanted to, is that kind of what you were saying? Well, not rhetorical, but it's like, this, this is what we want. We want God to forgive us for all of our sins and for all of these things that, you know, that right. we don't do. But is it actually saying God has oh. granted? You oh. know, I mean, it's us. Not asking, until that, I got praying. you. This is not actually a teshuva statement. Um, we're not asking for forgiveness. We're going beyond that. We're saying we didn't, whatever we did, we didn't, we, it, it, it's, it's null any promise, oath, whatever, it's not even asking for teshuva. Now, that line that I read to you, keep that in mind throughout the time that I'm speaking. Um, uh, God, I'm not gonna get through anything. Um, because when it says, all shall be forgiven the entire community of Israel, that part of the prayer is almost as important as the first part. It's almost like we've got this deal with God where we can annul everything and God's gonna forgive us. And that's why we're here speaking about it because it's going to get a little bit more complex than that because that seems like a total cop out. It seems rhetorical to say to God, everything that I'm about to do in the coming year doesn't count. I don't even need to theoretically then apologize for it next year, right? Because not only was it inadvertent, it was actually a commitment of our promise that I never even intended to keep in the first place. And I told you, God, that I didn't. All right, I just want one more. Susie, did you have something? And then I want to move on because I'll never get to it. Yes. Right, you're thinking about the other passage that we're going to read during the service before we get to um, the, the Ashamnu, Bagadnu, the thing where we hit ourselves, where it says, for sins between us and God, God atones. For sins between us and other people, God does not atone. I mean, God does not grant um, absolution for it or forgiveness for it until we make it right with the other person. And so you're doing something on a higher level, which is let's attach this other piece and synthesize it with this piece. But this piece punchline is not even a prayer okay problem number two three depending the uh, anti-semitism part is true the fact that it is troubling because it's looking to the forward the biggest part for the one of the biggest questions for us to ask is this is not a prayer kol nidre is not a prayer it is 
quite literally, a legal formula for the annulment of vows. It is a legal formula. What is another legal formula that we use in Judaism regularly at weddings? The ketubah, right? Can you imagine the rabbi or the cantor getting up at the wedding and saying, I want to sing the ketubah? Because one of the falsities of Kol Nidra is we do it because of tradition, because that tune was written at Mount Sinai. It's one of what we call the Messinai songs. It's not even a prayer. It's, it's no different than a ketubah. This is a legal, uh, what did I call it? A legal formula. So that's one of the great things that I knew, but learned more about in preparing for today is legal formulas are totally different. The thing that you were saying about sins between us and God and, and, and then go, that leads us into, and sins between us and other people, that goes into the um, vidui, the confessional part of the service, that is more in the, in the realm of liturgy. This is not liturgy. That was problematic for the rabbis too. Why would we take a legal formula and insert it into a service? Especially when we are actively participatory in the service for confession, for um, 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 accountability, for acknowledging what it is that we've done wrong. Okay, so it's a, it, we, um, The criticism, by the way, of Kol Nidre has been since its inception, and that's one of the other reasons why. So let me tell you the five objections. I just want to summarize all the objections since the 800s about Kol Nidre. Number one, it's not a prayer. It's a formula of annulment of vows between us and God. Uh, it doesn't even mention God, by the way, you'll notice. And by the way, that's why it's in Aramaic. Traditional ketubot are in Aramaic. They're not in Hebrew. Okay, any legal document, ancient legal document, is Talmudic, and the Talmud was written in Aramaic, not in Hebrew. The Gemara. Number two, both the Rishonim and the Geonim, these are the guys who wrote all liturgy. All the liturgy that we use today, that you said this morning at services, with the exception of Torah verses that were pulled out, which were inserted into our tefillah, the, these guys who live 5th century, 6th century, 7th century, 8th century, they, um, they didn't believe, and Sam, you alluded to this, and you alluded to it with intention, they did not believe, and they had a really hard time with this idea, can you release vows wholesale? If you want to make a vow, um, there is a way to do that, by the way. You can undo vows in Jewish law. There are other legal formulas where basically you go to the rabbi, or you go to the Beit Din, and you say, I made this vow, I really didn't know that I wasn't going to be able to keep this vow. And these are typically vows that in, in, in include things like money. You know, like, I didn't know what my financial situation then was. And we see this all the time, people unable to fulfill pledges to certain things. You go to the rabbi and your vow is annulled. It's not a big deal. Why do you do this? They thought it was completely redundant. There already is something for this in Judaism. Number three, um, the issue that Alex talked about, which was anti-Semitism. It also goes against Torah law, right? The Torah never says um, you can lie, knowingly or not, as long as you acknowledge the fact that you're going to lie and that it should be annulled before you tell it. In other words, this seems so very un-Jewish to the rabbis. Number four is, um, finally, do we even need it? I sort of said that before, but on era of Rosh Hashanah and traditional shuls, by the way, in the, um, in the traditional machzer on era of Rosh, um, there is a whole section um, where after services you basically meet with the Beit Din to discuss matters of vows from the last year that you, that you broke and the ones that you may break. And so again, there's this redundancy. So the three main things, I've gone from five to three, but it's easier to do it this way. One is it's not a prayer. Two is that it leads to anti-Semitism and is against Torah law and just doesn't make any sense. And three, it's not even right. And we're doing it at the beginning of Yom Kippur. Okay, so now I've ruined Kol Nidre for you. <laughs> Why, I guess, is the question is, did it stay in? 
there were rabbis who took it out completely. By the way, one of the um, false narratives, false stories about the Kol Nidre was it was it was done and then it was canceled. They didn't even do it. And then after the Spanish Inquisition, it was done again. It was reinserted because you had all of these Spanish Jews who converted to Christianity and at least once a day needed to go to the synagogue in hiding to tell God that the vows and commitments that they made toward the church were null and void. That's, um, that's not that's not real. That is a made up uh, urban legend, if you will, urban myth. That between sort of like 1391 and 1492, that the Muranos could go once a year and be off the hook for promising, making vows and oaths to the church, to Jesus. And they would go and they would say, Kol Nidra. By the way, one of the reasons why we, we even the scholars say, think that that's not true is because during the Spanish Inquisition, even in hiding, going and finding a synagogue or creating a synagogue in the basement of someone's house was really, really risky. You would get killed, be imme immediately get killed if you were caught, and, and we don't think that they were that courageous at that time. All right, I have to be able to read. Uh, oh, and then there's the whole, the music is beautiful thing. So the question is, how did it, how did it stay? What was the staying power of Kol Nidre? And I'll talk about this for like five minutes and then we'll open up to questions. Because um, I have so much material and I can't read my reading and some read my writing. I actually wrote notes. I didn't even use a laptop. Ha, huh, I kicked it old school. Um, oh, and it's emotionally powerful and it gives some of us comfort and it reminds us of our parents and grandparents who are no longer with us because we used to sit in shul with them. I mean, that's another very valid reason for why we do it. None of those are the real reasons why we do it, of course. The real reasons are as follows. So, what do we call a synagogue in Hebrew? What's the Hebrew for a synagogue? Beit Knesset. Beit Knesset, right? Uh, house of assembly. And, but really what is, what is the synagogue part when we're there with the prayer books? It is a Beit what? A house of what? Tefillah. A Beit Tefillah, a house of prayer. It's also a Beit Knesset, a house of assembly. It's also a Beit Midrash, a house of study. And when you're doing all three of those things, you have a Beit Knesset. It's sort of the umbrella term, Beit Knesset. But a Beit Tefillah is a house of prayer. And during Rosh Hashanah services, Yom Kippur services, Shabbat services, Yontif services, we are in a house of prayer. <clears throat> we have a prayer book, we have responses, we have a cantor or a rabbi. You don't need a cantor or a rabbi, secret. Um, in order to have a service, you just need a minion, right? So a house of prayer is really a holy space. It replicates the first temple and the second temple, even in the way that we set up the bima, which is a just basically different version of the altar. The kedosh kedoshim, the holy of holies, we replicate that with the holy ark, the tablets, and the and the, the thing from uh, Harrison Ford. Um, do, 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 do. That uh, the the um, Ark of the Covenant is our Aron Hakodesh. Like everything's got the setup of a Beit Tefillah going all the way back to the Temple periods. There is this idea, though. It's not an idea; it's a reality. That only on Yom Kippur, on Yom Kippur alone, we are being summoned by God to court, and that the Beit Tefillah is also the courthouse on Yom Kippur. It's both, it's got a dual setting. Um, because there is a case being made against us, we are, as it were, on trial during the 25 hours or so of Yom Kippur. Right, and I'm, I know the liturgy sort of Instinctively, we know that there is this idea of judgment because since you were little kids, in religious school we talked about the old man up in heaven with the book of life, right? And who's gonna live and who's gonna die and who by fire and who by storm. But I don't think that we see this clearly enough or explicitly enough that you are on trial for your life. Um, my, one of my teachers and mentors, uh, Rabbi Ray Warren from Temple Sinai in Denver said, and taught me that Yom Kippur is a rehearsal for death. 
Not for dying, but for death. What happens after you die? The judgment piece. If you remember, it may vaguely remind you, I may vaguely remind you, that God has two thrones that God sits on. One is sort of this throne of glory and love and compassion, and one is the throne or the seat of judge. And one's a nice God and one's a harsher God. Um, one's the God who celebrates and is happy with his children or her children, and the other one judges us harshly. So envision, if you will, and this is really one of the things I learned in preparing for today, is how clear the rabbis were in, in, in not being so warm and fuzzy about Yom Kippur. The fasting is great, the, the, what kind of clothes you're supposed to wear, the music, the power of the melodies and the liturgy, but we're on trial. And um, I think that that is a powerful concept. And so the, the idea of putting this legal text, this legal formula at the beginning, at the outset of the service, makes a lot of sense if you think of it in that, in that way. When you go into court to say a legal, to recite a legal text, makes a lot of sense. So that's one of the things, and I have a lot of, um, there's a beautiful midrash about when, when Abraham um, goes to God, uh, God goes to Abraham and says, I'm gonna have Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed. And you remember Abraham starts to actually put God on trial sort of how Moses does in that text I read to you before. And so I want, you know, don't kill, what if there's 50 righteous or 40 righteous or five righteous people, it's not right for you to destroy the cities if there's any righteous people there. And turns out there were no righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah. It was sort of like Los Angeles in the Valley. <laughs> and that works, that plays a lot better in San Francisco. And um, the rabbis in this midrash are teaching us that even God is on trial to some extent. I know that's very progressive. If I were wearing tzitzit right now, I would probably not say that. But, but God is on trial to a certain extent. But we are as well. So I want you to think about that. There is a legal case being fought out, which is um, us. We are the legal case. So we become a bait tefillah, a house of worship and a bait team, a judge, uh, a court of law. We have to then admit to guilt during this 25 hours of Yom Kippur, and we do that in a variety of ways. The highlight of it is the Bidui and the Ashamnu. We have wronged you through gluttony and we have wronged you through the alphabetical list of things that we've done wrong. But then there's this other question when it comes to cold injury specifically, and this is the last section that I'm gonna talk about, then I'll open it up, that I think is fascinating. The question needs to be vague now that we're at the Beit Dean, can you actually change the past and can you change the future? And now I wanna to get to intentional sins versus unintentional sins. Intentional sins, that is things that you do to wrong others or God that you did on purpose, knowingly. Right, telling someone that you're going to do something for them and then knowing you're not gonna do it for them. Entering into a covenantal relationship with someone knowing that you really won't be able to honor that commitment. Agreeing to keep the laws of Judaism and then breaking them every chance you get on purpose, right? These are not forgiven. Anything that we do is not forgiven if we do it on purpose. But there is this concept that great is teshuva because repentance, which means returning to ourselves, allows us to change the past in this way and in this way only and then it goes back to why kol nidre is kosher. Any sin that we committed deliberately turns into an inadvertent sin on Yom Kippur. All we have to do is two things. We have to show up, participate in the service, 
and we have to, this is the entire basis of Teshuvah, quite frankly, we have to not take for granted the mental element, that is to say, our mental desire to say we can do better, we missed the mark. When we say the prayers and engage in a process of true teshuva, to what Gail was saying, it's all about accountability. Now, whether we decide to change in the coming year or not is what Kol Nidre is about. But the intention of being on trial at Yom Kippur services is the intention of change. And when we state publicly that intention to change, that is to apologize, be accountable for our sins, the people we hurt and the things that we did that were wrong, we change anything that was done on purpose, anything that was done deliberately, we spiritually and legally change it to inadvertent, and inadvertent sins are forgivable by God and by the community. Obviously people have to accept your apology, but when you apologize to someone for something that you said, did, thought, or felt, and they accept your apology, it wipes out the premeditation of the sin itself. It doesn't mean that we forgive and forget. That is not a Jewish thing. We forgive and we remember, but we're not allowed to hold grudges, don't forget. Right, grudges are not kosher. But the idea that our sin can become inadvertent by participating in a Yom Kippur 25 hour day of prayer is kind of cool. It actually does allow us to change the past. Pure repentance allows us to say what we did, the sin we committed this past year is no longer an intentional sin. It's now a sin of uh, an inadvertent sin. Teshuva automatically does this. This is how we change the past. It's called in Judaism Hatarat Nedarim. It releases all of the vows. Kol Nidre does this for us. It makes all of our vows inadvertent retroactively. Hatarat Nedarim, the annulment of vows, is retroactive as long as we're sincere and remorseful, remorseful and accountable. So, what Kol Nidre does and what Kol Nidre did for Moses on that very first Yom Kippur was it changed God. By the way, if God says, I'm going to kill all the people and doesn't do it, that's a big theological problem because God can't be caught saying things and then not following up. How does Moses catch God in that? God, Moses says, you promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That vow, that promise, that commitment trumps, is bigger than, is more important than your feelings right now of anger and resentment toward the Israelites for, for, for building the golden calf. And that's why God forgives Moses. Yom Kippur does the same thing for us. It basically takes the entire golden calf incident and turns it on its head. And if the Israelites can be forgiven for the golden calf incident, we can be forgiven for the sins that we've committed in the last year. The future aspect of Kol Nidre, the idea of, I just talked about changing the past, Kol Nidre changes the future. We can't go to Shul and say to God, we are going to commit sins in the coming year that we did maliciously or with intent we need to be able to say to God that these vows and promises and oaths that we are going to do in the next year, they're inadvertent. We didn't know, even before we even made them, that we weren't going to fulfill them. So it's not this sort of cop-out. That's what the Bishkaga means. It's, it's not a cop-out. It's a way of us saying that in order to pray and be accountable, we have to acknowledge that we're going to do things in the next year that we shouldn't do. So let's at least say, hey God, these are inadvertent. And that will allow us to engage in teshuva a year from now. I know that that is like very confusing and I'm not smart enough to explain it better than I just did. But I think this idea of suspended animation of human behavior is a really important aspect of our work as Jews. 
In other words, we have to suspend for a moment all of those things that there are the have tos and the should haves and the could haves and the would haves and the voices of our parents and grandparents telling us to be these perfect idealized people and understand that we're going to mess up and therefore try to change the past by doing teshuva and we're also gonna mess up moving ahead. And we're just saying, hey God, we know this. So please God, treat our sins in the coming year as inadvertent. Because our goal on the 10th day of Tishrei, just like Moses's, is to make change and to become the change. Even if on the 11th of Tishrei and the 12th of Tishrei we go right back to where we started, our goal has to be change. And that's what the Kol Nidre in the beginning of the service as a legal document allows us to at least think about. Questions? Yes? Why, why is it that Kol Nidre is metaphorically equivalent or uh, connected to the, the, the concept of a whisper of wings or a whispering of wings? What is that connection? I don't know. What you, where, where does it say that? In the song, we, when, when we sing about Kol Nidre. Oh, the so reading in the old prayer book? Yes. Oh, what that's that? just what poetic. That? It's just a poetic. It's just a poetic it's, it's thing that the guys who wrote the Gates of Repentance put in. But it doesn't mean anything other than that. It's not a whisper. Tahat it's compassion. What? Tahat compassion. Oh, where's that? Where's Tahat Confession on Kol Nidre? I don't see it. Is that before? Under the wings of God's presence? Yeah. No? I think it was it was a piyut written by Chaim Stern in his editorial board. Tacha Kanfi Ashina, being under the divine wings, or the, uh, being under the wings of the Shekhinah is in Hashkiveinu. It's a prayer that we say every night. Asking God to pores sukat shalom aleinu, to, to spread the shelter of peace over us. But I think it was just poetry written by the so guys who... To the, to the, begin, the very beginning of the Kol Nidre. Well, again, if you're thinking about it in terms of a rehearsal for death, then I think this idea of transitional, transitional um, mental and spiritual movement from this place to the world to come, symbolically, the idea of being in the presence of God in a very, very serious way, right. more than any other night. It's Shabbat Shabbaton, it's the Sabbath of Sabbaths. Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You're in a space for 25 hours that, that cannot be replicated in the other 25 hours of the year. And, and you are thinking in terms of, you may not be, but you, you can think in terms of, um, when I die, what, what, what am I answering for? That's where the change comes from. Because the idea that another translation from Gates of Repentance that I always liked was this idea that even, even the hosts of heaven are judged. Even the angels get judged. By the way, P.S., this is where the Kol Nidre appeal comes from. The idea, by the way, the, the, the Kol Nidre fundraiser should actually happen in the Torah service in the morning because that's right before Yisker and donation on Yom Kippur, which is also a replica of um, the sin and guilt offerings from the temple. But this is a 3,000 year old custom. It's not a custom in Judaism when you do it more than twice, then it becomes the law. But the idea was that you gave money in, the, in this Kol Nidre appeal moment, whether it's on the night or the morning of, before Yisker because you were asking for expiation on behalf of your dead relatives. And so a donation is the replica of the offering, the korban, and they gave goats and, you know, different things to the priests and we give money. And those of us who grew up in really traditional shuls remember them auctioning off aliyot on Yom Kippur morning, right? One times high, 10 times high, 100 times high to the biggest bidder, because that's when the temple did its major fundraiser and people thought, God, this is so awful and, and, and tacky. And yeah, but it's 3,000 years old. And if <laughs> the idea is if you want to make sure that your dead relatives get a good judgment because even the hosts of heaven are judged on Yom Kippur, you make a donation. You give tzedakah because that is expiation, just like a goat was 3,000 years ago. 
or the half shekel. Sam, the question. Old, the old Yisra prayers had the words, Shani no day sit on top. When you said Yisra, that's part of the... You would say... Shani no day sit on top. That I'm giving a... a, a from your heart that you're giving tzedakah. For, the, for, Yisker, yeah. for Yisker, yes. There's a, that's all connected to it. We do it at nighttime because it just seems like that's become the tradition in Reformed communities. But it's supposed to, it's supposed to be done. It is traditionally done in the morning service. But we don't auction off aliyot. In fact, Davka, the aliyot um, at Karish and Beth Israel, our custom is the Yom Kippur aliyot are given to new members. Right, the Rosh Hashanah Aliyot are, are, we honor the recipients of the Amdur Awards, and on Yom Kippur, we honor new members of the Senate, people who have joined in the last year. I don't know why I decided to do that, but I thought it would be cool, so that's what we do. And we did it more than once, so it's now tradition. Once is question, twice is well. Yeah. Well, I just think people who choose to do what 85% of the American Jewish community decides not to do are courageous and should be acknowledged. Any other questions? I'm sure there are more questions than I can give you answers. And this was my first, uh, when Steve asked us to pick topics, I didn't want to, I wanted to pick something that I really wanted to know more about, um, which is, which has turned into a lot of fun and lots of notes that I can't read. But if I take these up, I think it'll be even better. And what's cool is we got to do this this time, but I think on, on, on this Kol Nidre, we can think of three things. I, I'm going to be thinking of three things. Number one is that idea of Beit Din, that we are in a house of judgment. And if that sounds too harsh, then we are, we are in the divine courthouse. We are, we are on trial. That this is really kind of serious. Number two is our words are very, very, very meaningful. We should go into the next year thinking, I'm not going to try or make an attempt to lie or make a false vow but I'm gonna give myself a little bit of benefit of the doubt and at least try to make sure that I only do the inadvertent ones. And if I do the ones that are a little bit more knowingly, then, you know, I'll at least be able to say who are inadvertent. Um, and number three is that for 1800 years, um, I'm sorry, for 1200 years, we've been, we've had a very strong movement tradition to not even do it at all. Um, because it's it's really complex and it brings up a lot of questions. I guess I would say when we're doing it this year, let's think about how serious it is, a little bit about how controversial it is, and uh, mostly about how lucky we are that we get to be uh, in a country and in a place where we get to freely um, and openly worship in a church, um, that we are the luckiest Jews in the history of history, that we aren't Moranos living in the Spanish Inquisition having to hide, but that we actually get to do it out in public and, and remember how lucky we are um, that we get to live in an open and free society and do this.